purpose of this instruction film about the throw overboard type of Viking inflatable life raft is to give the potential user an overall view of the evacuation procedure and a better understanding of the critical phases connected with the use of inflatable life rafts. In a film of this length we are not able to look at all the factors involved in a rescue operation at sea. It is therefore important to read the instructional material required by the regulations on all ships in which it is the duty of each member of the crew to study carefully. This film was shot on an exercise carried out by the Ministry of Fisheries training ship Las A. Cruiser. When a new crew member reports for duty, one of the first things that happens is that he is made acquainted with the ship's muster list, which informs each crew member of his role in an emergency situation. Here, for example, we see the instruction charts relating to the use of the life rafts. We are now ready to begin the exercise. If an emergency arises at sea, the vessel involved sends a distress signal to the nearest coastal radio station using the international emergency frequency. All ships obliged to carry radio also listen on this frequency. The name and position of the vessel and the nature of the emergency are the most important items of information needed to ensure a speedy and effective rescue operation. The majority of the crew, who in this case are gathered in the mess, await instructions from the bridge. Additional information about the situation of the vessel, such as weather, wind and other conditions in the area, can be very important to the rescue operation. The ringing of the alarm bell means that the crew should go to the emergency stations, bringing their life jackets, or in this case, their immersion suits. After a little training, these immersion suits, which protect against critical loss of body heat, can be put on very quickly. Notice that the integrated gloves can be quickly removed if the wearer needs to have his hands free. Even without the gloves, water will not get into the suit. The crew are now on their way to the rescue stations. The ladder, which will later be used to get down to the raft, is here paid out and secured by two members of the crew. When the painter line of the life raft has been properly secured on board and the order given, the lashing holding the raft is released and the raft is eased over the side. When the remainder of the painter line has been pulled out of the container, the raft is inflated by a firm tug on the line. The raft will be fully inflated in the course of about 60 seconds, with minor variations depending on the actual temperature at the time. As can be seen here, the raft is equipped with an automatically deployable sea anchor, which is released when the raft is being inflated, and therefore contributes to the stability of the raft at an early stage in the launching procedure.
The raft is now manoeuvred to the ladder, which is already hanging at the side of the ship. The whistling noise we can hear is quite normal and comes from the safety valves on the raft blowing off excess CO2. This always happens in connection with the inflation of a life raft. The positional light on top of the raft, which has a built-in blink, has already been activated during inflation of the raft, but should be switched off when not needed. The crew now enter the raft with great care. Despite the fact that they are wearing immersion suits, it can often be very difficult to rescue people out of the water under the sort of weather conditions normally encountered in a distress situation at sea. When all are safety on board, the painter line is cut and the knife replaced in the holder provided. It is now a question of getting away from the sinking ship as quickly as possible, using the paddles supplied in the raft. In some situations it might be advisable to haul in the sea anchor while paddling, if it is difficult to get away from the side of the ship, for example. In a hectic emergency situation, it could happen that some of those on board ship might not manage to get down to the life raft before it is cut adrift. The men we see here are wearing their immersion suits and have therefore greatly increased their chances of survival. The crew in the life raft are well aware of the importance of keeping a sharp lookout for survivors in this phase of the operation and have in fact already spotted the two men left behind on the sinking ship. The light on the immersion suit should, of course, be switched on if visibility is low. To the survival suit is also attached a so-called body line, so that several survivors can link themselves together in the water. This can be especially valuable if an exhausted person has to be towed along in the water. In the meantime, the crew in the life raft have hauled in the sea anchor and are paddling the raft towards the two men in the water. The raft is equipped with a rescue line with quoit, here being thrown out to those in the water. One of those in the water gets hold of the quoit and pulls it up around his upper arm. The line can now be hauled into the raft. Those in the water must be got onto the raft as quickly and as securely as possible. The sea anchor is now deployed again to stabilize the raft and minimize drift away from the position of the wreck. The entrance to the raft is closed and a lookout posted. Keeping a sharp lookout is vitally important for a successful rescue operation, so that the exact position of the raft can be signaled if a plane or ship comes into the vicinity. As a result of the distress signal sent out by the ship, the rescue services are getting on with the most important part of a rescue operation, picking up survivors. Helicopters like this one have for many years played a central role in rescue operations at sea, partly because of the maneuverability of helicopters and the use made of modern navigational equipment, but also, and by no means least, because of the skill of the crew members who pilot the coastal rescue service helicopters. Whilst the helicopter is on its way to the scene of the shipwreck, we can take a closer look at what all crew members should know about life-saving operations at sea. This or a similar instruction chart concerning the operation of the life raft will, as we have said, be included in the compulsory training manuals on the ship. Here, for example, we see an American training manual. This instruction book is published by the Danish Association of Shipowners. And among the contents are a section on life jackets, 
a section on lifeboats and life rafts, how to enter the life raft, what to do if you have to jump overboard wearing a life jacket. Nowadays, approved life rafts ought to be fitted with a hydrostatic release unit. The purpose of this unit is to release the raft if the ship sinks so quickly that there is no time to release it manually. This pelican hook is used in connection with manual operation of the raft. If the ship should sink without allowing time for manual launching, water will enter the release unit through the hole shown here. When the release unit is about three meters underwater, it will be activated by water pressure releasing the raft. The raft container, which is sufficiently buoyant to float to the surface, is now only connected to the ship via the painter line of the raft and the so-called weak link. The weak link is strong enough to release the raft if the water at the scene of the shipwreck is deeper than the length of the painter line and weak enough in this situation to be snapped as the inflated raft surfaces. As mentioned earlier, some rafts are equipped with automatically deployable sea anchors in accordance with some national regulations. Whether the sea anchor is automatic or not, it is very important during the first phase of the evacuation, when the raft is close to the sinking ship, that the anchor does not foul some part of the ship. In the event of this happening anyway, the raft is equipped, depending on size, with one or two knives, which can be used to cut loose the sea anchor. Note that the raft is also equipped with a reserve sea anchor. The knife, position shown here, is primarily used to cut the painter line of the raft, that is, the line connecting it to the sinking ship. In order to avoid damage to the raft, the knife should be returned after use to the sheath provided. If the raft at some point should capsize, it can be fairly easily righted if the correct procedure is followed. The raft should be climbed onto from the water on the side where the CO2 bottle is placed. By using the rung of the ladder, which is about 40 centimeters under the surface, and getting hold of the right-wing strap, you can haul yourself onto the upturned raft. The raft is righted by standing on the cylinder bag, heaving on the line and leaning backwards. The raft can be much more easily righted if it can be turned into the wind. After writing, the raft is best entered on the side where the boarding ramp is situated. Other people who might be in the water in the vicinity of the raft should be helped on board. The emergency kit on board the raft contains equipment which can be of great help to victims of a shipwreck. The thermal protective aids can be used to help people who have lost a lot of body heat due to immersion in cold water. The suit is lined on the inside with a material that reflects the body heat of the person in distress, greatly reducing the danger of further loss of heat. Seasick tablets should be taken as soon as possible because those on board a life raft will almost without exception suffer from seasickness with a consequent loss of natural reactions and powers of judgment. The signalling equipment available in the raft, so vital for the final stages of a rescue operation, is as follows. Parachute rockets. Hand flares. Smoke signals, signaling mirror, signaling lamp, and a signaling whistle. Instructions for the use of this signaling equipment are found on board the raft, as well as in the general instruction manuals on the ship.
The raft also carries one or two balers, depending on the size of the raft. Sponges for soaking up moisture and condensation. Medicine kit. One and a half liters of drinking water per person. 500 grams emergency rations per person. And fishing tackle. The top of the raft has troughs to collect rainwater. There is also an emergency repair kit to facilitate basic repairs in the case of acute damage to the raft. It is quite normal today that rafts are equipped with an emergency transmitter. Instructions for use are of course also included, no matter what the make of the transmitter. The type of emergency equipment found in a raft is now established by international agreement, based on a wide range of experience. The raft is fitted with a double floor, which can be inflated by using the bellows provided in the raft, something which has unfortunately often been forgotten in connection with shipwrecks over the last few years. And we would like to make the point very clear. An inflated double floor offering greater insulation under the majority of sea conditions will make a stay in the raft a much more comfortable experience. Now back to the rescue action at sea. The lookout in the raft has heard the rotor noise of the helicopter and it is now vitally important to signal the position of the raft. This can be done as here by firing a parachute rocket. In clear weather, lighting a hand flare, as we can see here, will make the raft more visible to rescue vessels. The orange smoke signals, also found in the raft, are also visible over long distances in daylight. In addition, they are a great help to a rescue helicopter trying to determine the best angle of approach to the raft. When the rescue helicopter approaches the raft ready to lift off survivors, the roof of the raft should be pressed flat, best achieved as seen here by climbing onto it. In some cases, it might help to let the air out of the arch tube. Here, the helicopter crew chooses to use a single lift to rescue the survivors. To avoid an unpleasant shock from static electricity, it is best to let the harness and lifting wire touch the water before getting hold of the harness from the raft. A diagram on the harness shows how it should be lowered over the head and under the armpits. Then the adjustable breast strap should be tightened. Hold on to this strap or let your arms hang down by your sides during the lift. Don't hold on higher up the harness as this man is doing here, as there is in this case a risk of sliding out of the harness. In order to avoid unnecessary danger situations, do not try to release yourself from the harness. Leave this to the crew of the helicopter when you have been hauled on board. In a situation like this, when a person has to be rescued directly from the sea, the helicopter will use a double lift. This member of the rescue crew, here getting ready to be lowered down to the water, is fastened to the same wire as the harness which will be put around the distressed person. A double lift will generally be used where at all possible, as this method, because of the experience of the rescue personnel, is the safest and quickest. Despite the fact that the use of the rescue equipment shown in this film may seem extremely easy and straightforward, and despite the fact that this equipment has been greatly improved in recent years and is definitely easier to use, the old proverb should not be forgotten. The sea is a good servant, but a harsh taskmaster. So be prepared and study the material found on board your ship relating to the all-important subject of safety at sea.